Hello, and welcome everybody to Anatomy of, or Dissecting the Anatomy of the State, uh, a book by Murray Rothbard that I thought uh, didn't do a good job uh, describing what the state actually was, and so I wanted to kind of give my perspective on the whole thing. <clears throat> and uh, I had talked about it last time, uh, some of this stuff, and went through the first two chapters. We're going to go through the rest of the book. I'm going to do a quick summary of uh, some of the stuff that we talked about in there. Uh, you can go check that out if you are interested in that. Um, but uh, <clears throat> basically, the, the primary thing that he doesn't really acknowledge is that the state is an institution. The government and the state are two different things, um, and the, there is a separation there. Um, and <clears throat> uh, then he makes a couple mistakes when with like the whole libertarian thing of seeing... Uh, seeing the society as a set of individuals and not as uh, a unit or, or um, a grouping of families um, into tribes and then into uh, larger constituencies up to the size of a nation. And then I guess empire would be the top of that, which would be uh, groupings of nations into something, but it seems like uh, the na or into a single uh, unit. But um, the di nation is about as far as an extent that you can get uh, when it comes to... Uh, the creation of a state <clears throat> that is stable because the cultural differences between the groups within the empire are going to cause disunity and and friction and stuff like that where uh in within the nation there's enough uh shared culture and background and uh tradition and bloodlines and stuff like that that uh, generally those people get along and there isn't any issues. And if they they do have issues with each other, uh, it's more just a different, same goals, different perspectives instead of, um, to entirely different goals, uh, which happens when you have more than one nation working under the purview of a government. So, uh, that is kind of a synopsis of what we talked about in chapter or to cover kind of the first two chapters of the book. Um, if you want a full recap of what I talked about in there, uh, go watch my previous video. <clears throat> but uh, to continue on with what we got today, so um, the next thing that he kind of dives into is the fact that uh, the government is supposedly parasitic. <clears throat> but I don't believe this is actually the case. So uh, just because the government can act in a parasitic nature does not mean that it always does. And I would say it is closer to a symbiote relationship than a parasitic one. <clears throat> there are two basic classes of people in a society when it comes to government. Uh, those are uh, those that desire power and those that do not. Uh, the job of the power broker class is to maintain power, and the easiest way to do that is to be good stewards of the people. Uh, provide them with a safe environment in which they can raise their families, and they will leave you to play your uh, and the the people will leave you to play your Game of Thrones. Generally. Most everyone in America, or not just America, but most everyone in most nations do not care about the Game of Thrones that are going on. They just want some political entity that's not so oppressive that they can raise their kids and they won't, uh, you know, be indoctrinated to chop off their dicks and stuff like that with, like, this trans children movement. Um, and I know libertarians with <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that's been happening, uh, you know, a lot of what they say rings true. And I'm definitely down to have libertarians as, like, an ally, um... And I know leftists use that term all the time, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of like, I'm Christian nationalist. So there's a, in the t current goals that we have, there is a lot of overlap and places where we could, uh, have agreements and kind of work towards similar goals, um, in the meantime. And eventually we're going to hit a fork in the road where we're going to have to go our separate ways. But in the meantime, uh, I think libertarians and, uh, and Christian nationalists could work together, especially with the amount of tyranny that's going on, uh, within our, our government in the current, uh, moment. <clears throat> that being said, uh, I'm kind of going over some points of disagreement to see where we're going to maybe diverge on those, uh, topics. <clears throat> and one of these is to do with, uh, the power broker class, right? So you basically have these family units and the family units just want to be left alone to do their own thing. <clears throat> as long as they can do that, uh, generally they're seen, uh, they don't really care what the government does and all of its various power games. Uh, and they're even willing to participate in some of those power games and stuff like that, as long as it's, uh, seen as a, a net good for the society. A lot of times that's corrupted and, and things get <clears throat> twisted. An example of that would be, um, inscription, which, uh, we will touch on a little bit later in <clears throat> kind of a different detail, but, uh, you know, families are willing to send their, uh, kids to war and part of it is out of shame and, 
uh, you know, also, but a sense of duty in the idea that <clears throat> uh, the government kind of has the common interest in mind. And while our current government, that definitely isn't the case, that doesn't mean that all governments share that issue, right? Uh, <clears throat> as long as the government is run by, uh, run by people of the nation in which it is being ruled over, generally things work out pretty good and they, uh, have their, amb the ambitions and drives of the political class line up with the desires of the, uh, plebeian or normal class <clears throat> and things work out generally. Okay. There's always going to be issues. There's always going to be one group wanting more power than the other group. And, you know, there's going to be a wrangling for power and, and other various struggles here and there. But like I said, the, the issues that they come to, it's going to be same goal, different uh, objective versus when you have an empire, which is uh, uh, different objectives entirely. So <clears throat> those are the things you got to keep in mind. Um, so... So that it's provide them with a safe environment for them to play their Game of Thrones. It is much like the relationship of a farmer and his animals, uh, and that's not to degrade uh, anybody of the plebeian class. I am definitely part of that plebeian class. So, um, if they uh, take care, uh, if they if the stewards take care of the good, take good care of their animals, they don't have to worry himself about the animals trying to break out or worse, uh, attacking him directly. As such, relationship is not as la lopsided as libertarians would have you believe. <clears throat> Um, so that's kind of the perspective, uh, on that. That was, that kind of covers our, uh, chapter three and what's going on there, uh, which was called, uh, how the state preserves itself. Um, and also within this, he talks about, uh, natural rights, or maybe that's the next chapter. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> the next thing that he kind of brings up is, is that, I, um, oh, no, no, no. He talks about how people are controlled. So Rothbard makes a salient point, uh, that the primary way people are controlled is not through force, but by their culture, traditions, and religions. Uh, he then writes off uh, these office contrivances by the power brokers and sees them as simply an obstacle in the way of his ultimate goal, which is anarcho-capitalism. <clears throat> but these are important aspects of people's lives, and the thing that defines, defines them and gives them an identity as a people, as a nation, uh, to a people as a nation. As an example, let's... Uh, Say, a Christmas tradition of yours is to bake cookies. Now, it wouldn't be the end of the world if you decided uh, not to do that one year, but the human bonds, connections, and memories made from this tradition are more important to the people than simply not doing it because to lose that tradition is to lose an part of your identity as a family. <clears throat> uh, besides, the restrictions imposed uh, by the culture, tradition, and religion is not a one-way street. The nobility have to act in accordance with them as much as the commoners <clears throat> or the whole system falls apart. Sure, many times they do, uh, the, these traditions and other such things are done for show, and behind closed doors they don't follow the rules. But even requiring the outward appearance uh, is limiting on what they can reasonably do. The best example of this is Cicero in Rome, who embodied the virtues of Rome uh, so much that he gained uh, great respect from the Roman people and would and people would refer defer to his judgment on how to properly go forward in situations because he embodied the virtue so well. This would ultimately lead to his downfall because uh, those that did not follow those traditions of Rome, uh, Caesar namely, uh, was able to force him into a corner. But Cicero was a man born in the wrong time because the embodiment he embodied the virtues of an older Rome. And while the people identified and claimed to believe in those old virtues, their actions and uh, said otherwise. And this was not simply for the elite families, but for Roman, the Roman citizens as, uh, themselves. So while Cicero decided uh, to be contained or constrained by the old virtues in the hopes of pulling Rome back to a time when they lived more prudently, Caesar was a man of, of the traditions of the time and allowing him to politically out, and allowed him to politically outmaneuver Cicero and by extension all of the Senate. Uh, back to the original point, traditions are not contrivances by the elite, but a set of rules that govern daily behavior of a populace and induces the, uh, and that includes the rulers. This tradition, uh, these traditions over generations can break down and shift, and the rules become guidelines. Eventually, uh, the rules become guidelines and are eventually uh, replaced or disappear. These traditions were usually in place for a reason. However, this breakdown is usually a sign of society that is on its way down. 
as the bad habits that these traditions kept at bay come to the forefront and lead to the breakdown of society. An easy example of this is sex, sex out of wedlock. <clears throat> that was a rule that became a guideline and is now, uh, and now we have an epidemic of abortion and single mothers because of not following the rules and many thought, uh, that many thought was foolish. <clears throat> Rothbard writing off these things is foolish and short-sighted, uh, as they are, um, Rothbard writing these things off is foolish and short-sighted, as they are deeply important to the human condition. Uh, the, so, uh, so that's kind of the aspect right there. Um, and then he kind of touches on this idea of, uh, institutions and, uh, makes kind of a ridiculous point. So he says, what does he say? Um, can't find the specific quote. Uh, but anyway, uh, he basically infers that, uh, institutions aren't good because they can be corrupted. And I find this a foolish and silly thing to basically say. Um, so the idea, uh, so the ability for an institution to be corrupted does not mean all institutions are bad by, um, and also all institutions can and will be corrupted because there's evil in this world. They're going to try to subvert um, these kind of things. And this is one of the shortcomings of kind of Murray Rothbard's perspective is, um, you know, he doesn't uh, have the Christian perspective where he sees uh, this battle between good and evil, that there is uh, people who are, are evil and wicked in this world that uh, do disparage the good, the good, the beautiful, and the true, and that those people need to be uh, checked and, and things that need to be controlled and understanding that a lot of the rot uh, isn't just because of an institution or whatever. It's because of the people in those places of power or institutions um, are either having their worst nature and, and not being allowed to be checked or some other kind of thing. So anyway, continuing on. So the ability for an institution to be corrupted does not mean the institutions are bad. By Rothbard's same logic, one could claim that because a small, efficient company grows to a certain size and becomes bloated and inefficient and eventually collapses, uh, that all companies will reach this point. As such, we as a society should uh, do away with companies. Uh, a society is only as moral as the people in it, and an institution reflects the morality of the people uh, as it... Ah, morality of the people, as it is them that... What, uh, them that both run the institutions and allow them to exist. Uh, obviously, the power brokers are the ones that run the institutions, and the plebeians are the ones that basically allow it to exist. <clears throat> a revolutionary war was started over a tax of 3% because the people were moral, uh, moral and principled. The same cannot be said about Americans today. While um, the moral fabric of America certainly isn't gone, when compared to Americans of 1776, it is a far cry from where we've been. <clears throat> Uh, and just kind of think about that. Like we currently have the income tax. We have all these taxes, 30, like the, it was a 3% tax that they, they threw, I think it was the Boston tea party. They threw all the, the tea in the Harbor, that kind of, um, principle and willpower just doesn't exist in America anymore. And that's not necessarily, well, I, I'm going to say that's a bad thing. Um, but it's not something that you can't get back, right? Like America's become this, uh, bureaucratically bloated institution kind of thing. But as long as um, Americans go back to living good moral lives, then they can uh, kind of turn the ship around. Now, the problem is uh, most of the people that live in America aren't Americans anymore. Uh, technically, I'm Irish German, so that I'm not American. Uh, my family came over in like the 1800s. So that's, that's kind of the issue that America's facing right now is uh, there's no Americans to kind of pick up the mantle and be, be Rome's version of Cicero, right? Um, we kind of, I mean, Donald Trump, to a certain extent, was a little bit of column A, column B, where he was, uh, you know, he, he kind of make America great again kind of thing, where, uh, which was kind of a, a Cicero-type virtue, but then, uh, you know, the way he acted was probably more like a Caesar. Uh, well, maybe, I don't know, I guess he didn't, hasn't taken over the government. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so that's, uh, th those are some kind of things. Uh, Rothbard then touches on this idea of natural rights um, and how they don't seem to really work. But again, we have kind of different perspectives on why they don't work. <clears throat> uh, so Rothbard gets into the issue of natural rights, which I agree is a problem. Uh, and he simply says that the reason that they're a problem is because they're used, uh, they're 
turned upside down and used as a rubber stamp to justify uh, government corruption. That is because uh, they are founded not on a higher order of God, a thing uh, that he says is unnecessary in a society, but by man. As such, if uh, man created these rules, then he ought to be able to change them and define what they are to fit his needs. The only thing fighting these this urge is tradition, <clears throat> which, uh, as, had, as has been shown previously, can be broken down over time. Religion, on the other hand, is a much stronger firm foundation from which to build uh, cultural rules off of. It is much easier to write off one's ancestors as foolhardy, but to write off God as such is not an easy task. This is typically accomplished by changing the rules uh, as the breakdown of tradition. <clears throat> oh, this is typically accomplished not by changing the rules as the breakdown of tradition does, but by corrupting the people so that they no longer follow the heavenly path, but the devilish one. The difference is religion is the foundation and tradition is built off of uh, that tradition is built off of, and so traditions might change, uh, or how <clears throat> might change uh, how they are conducted and how they are kind of set upon the foundation uh, might differ, but the foundation is unchanging. The corruption happens when the foundation is changed, and set since the tradition is no long uh, no longer has the proper foundation, they collapse and new corrupt traditions are put in their place. So that's kind of uh, how how you, you kind of end up with this issue with when you come to natural rights, and that's one of the weak points of the American Constitution and stuff like that, is this idea of natural rights and not <clears throat> claiming, uh, putting in that they are God-given rights, and this is why I find the idea of uh, why you can't really have like a sense of freedom of religion and stuff like that, because you, you need a religion to be a founding principle for your morality, for your laws. So, like, I, I don't mind, <clears throat> well, outside of, like, basically devil worship, but you know, if Muslim countries want to have Sharia law, that is, you know, we are a Muslim country. We, these are our, the, this is our founding religion. And this is the, the rules and principles that we built, um, our religion off of. And that works, but like, you can't, that's where you have these issues. Like the original idea behind, um, freedom of religion was put in there because you had a bunch of different sects of Christianity. And in that regard, like you can have a bunch of different sects of Christianity under one roof. And because they are like, it kind of falls under the same idea of the nation where it's like different interpretations of the Bible, but like still the same goal where even like the, the closest religion to, uh, Christianity, which is, uh, Islam, like it's different enough that it like those two things kind of don't line up. They, they're close, but they don't line up enough. And so you're going to end up with all these issues. Um, and so the idea of like freedom of religion should be like limited to the idea of, you know, you could have, like freedom of sectarians maybe or something like that like it needs to be kind of reformatted because you can't just have uh free like you can't just have like uh hinduism and christianity and uh and uh islam like all under one roof and then have them all agree on like a final point like there's a lot of truth in all of three of those religions that they're going to agree on and there's things you can learn from all of those but uh, having all of those try to come to a final destination that is agreed on by all three of them just isn't going to happen. And that's why, that's what the great thing about nation states is, is it's like, all right, well, we're a group that believes in, in Hinduism. And so we're going to go make our own, uh, the, Hinduism is going to be our foundation for our society. And we're going to build all our traditions and, and st stuff off of that. And the Muslims can go to their thing and the Christians can go do their thing. And it's a great system. And, uh, that is why nationalism is the best, even though it is an ism, so it still has its flaws. <clears throat> um, so that's basically kind of our natural rights. Uh, then he gets into, um, oh, continue on with nat natural rights. Uh, Rothbard's issue with natural rights is that they can be turned upside down and used in the opposite way that they are intended. Uh, of course, for Christians, this is nothing new. The devil can quote, quote scripture, and if he can uh, turn the Bible upside down, then he can certainly do it with a silly document about government limits of power on its head, too. Talk about the Constitution. Uh, the real check on this isn't a document as uh, as that is simply a piece of paper. It is, uh, it is checked by those living under the Constitution to make sure that it is uh, in its proper form. The truth of the matter is, people are either too busy or lazy, and it, when it comes to this stuff, but at the end of the day, it is on you to enforce the stuff, and the ruling class counts on your apathy. 
right? And so that doesn't necessarily mean like marching or stuff like that. Like, uh, um, I forgot what, who said this. It might've been St. Augustine, which was like, uh, one man with God is the majority. And so, and also he, he also said, uh, live, uh, or show, dang it. What was the quote? Oh, speak the gospel always. And if you have to, or live the gospel always. And if you have to speak, right? So the best way to, um, get people to, to, uh, start living by the Bible and stuff like that is simply through your actions. Do what, uh, it says and, uh, live according to the teachings of Jesus. And then people will naturally be drawn into a more, uh, into what is actually in the Bible. So that, that those kind of actions are, are how you kind of turn this around. So it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, having to be super politically active and stuff like that. Just making sure that you live an upstanding moral life will make it so that, uh, people, because they have to keep like, let's say a, but we're run by a bunch of corrupt, evil people, right? They have to keep the mask up that says, well, we actually, uh, the leaders have to act like they believe and reflect your values, even if they don't. And so the, the more that you, you do those values, the more they have to keep the mask on. And the truth of the matter is the more they ba you basically kind of force them to have to act in a saintly way, uh, you know, eventually like kind of repetition and just muscle motion and stuff like that will make it so that they just kind of accidentally, um, uh, become like a more moral person. A, a great example might be, uh, if you're lifting weights, right? So like you, you don't really care about lifting weights, but you decide you're going to go to the gym every day and you do some basic stuff and you do that over and over again. And like, you know, you, you like, you're doing this to keep up a facade of, uh, you're this weightlifter. Well, eventually if you go to the gym every single day and you're lifting weights and you're, you're working out and stuff like that, just to keep up this facade that you're a weightlifter, like at a certain point, it's no longer a facade. You are a weightlifter. You do like that stuff. You exercise, right? So, um, you know, like the facade can only last so long. And the longer you have to keep up the facade, the over time, it just becomes your true self kind of thing. Uh, maybe people don't agree with that, but that's kind of how I see it. Uh, you know, there's definitely plenty of churchians and stuff like that that can use uh, the facade and stuff like that, or use try to use churchianity or the church in the Bible as like a shield. But um, you know, I think part of that is there's no check on them of truly uh, moral Christians. Uh, enough of them in the church, uh, you know, it has to kind of hit a critical value uh, for them to kind of crack and either be forced out of these churches or. Uh, kind of come back into the fold, as it were. You know, there's a lot of people that are just accidentally led astray. Um, and it's kind of, you know, it's partially their fault, partially, um, you know, the times that we live in, various issues. Anyway, we're off topic. Um, getting back. Um, so then he discusses this little part, and this is kind of an annoying thing, but not really a huge thing. But uh, later on, he discusses giving uh, the veto power to every individual. And this goes back to this whole individualist mindset of, <clears throat> well, if we want to make sure... So basically, he says, well, if you we want to make sure that a minority isn't, uh, you know, rights aren't being oppressed, then uh, every individual in the entire United States should be able to veto it, um, which is just insane. So uh, in our current political climate, uh, they may... That might help to stop the tyranny, tyranny that we are currently experiencing, but for everyday functions, this is unbelievably destructive. And this would deadlock almost everything outside of very slim situations in which the whole nation is on board fighting back against, uh, maybe on fighting against, back against an invading force. And that's not even a guarantee. You know, uh, I talked about last time the idea that you have to get, um, you know, government powers kept in check when, like, all of the masses agree that they, they don't want the government anymore and then they overthrow it. And that doesn't actually even take everybody. And, um, so even that like is more of a lenient system than this. And even that is hard to get e enough people on board to be like, all right, we're going to, we're willing to risk everything to overthrow the government. Right? So that's <clears throat> the idea that you're going to give a hundred percent of people on board and that you're not going to have one person veto this whole thing is just ridiculous. Uh, to sh show how ridiculous this position is, uh, let's take three people and have them decide what they want to eat. Um, and o the only way they're going to go out is if 
uh, all three of them agree and don't veto the idea. Now, one person is dead set on seafood and the other two hate seafood. How does this group ever uh, get out of this deadlock? The answer is they can't. Even if the situation is absurd, even if that situation is absurd, the deadlock could happen uh, with only three people. It couldn't work on the scale that is, uh, if it couldn't work on that scale, how is it supposed to work on the national scale? Of course, the answer is it can't. Um, and then as a final point to this whole thing, uh, Rothbard talks about how uh, treaties and uh, agreements between countries uh, don't sh don't hold up like a contract between two businesses would because they don't have any uh, rights or anything to be able to trade between people because that property is owned by other people. However, he's wrong. Uh, so he claims that governments have no rights or property in which to transfer from the state uh, to another. However, this is false because, uh, like it or not, states have the right of taxation and thus have the right uh, the right to transfer those rights and responsibilities, i.e. the defense of the new territory, to another state. So, yes, they don't own the territory, but they have jurisdiction over that territory, and they have the right to transfer that jurisdiction to another place, and so that new jurisdiction would be under the, the new laws of that area and the new um, taxation of that area and uh, the new um, defense of those of that country. Now, that gets into a bunch of weird stuff where I was talking about nations and and stuff like that, and so that, that new group might not fit, and there might be all these other issues, but that's a side issue. The matter of the fact is, uh, governments have enough sway and stuff like that to decide that they have control over that area, and therefore have the right to transfer that to another state. Now, the people in that state might not agree and might rebel and try to get back to the other state, or something like that, but, like, they, at the end of the day, they do still have that right. Um... So, that kind of uh, wraps it up. Uh, the book ends with some random libertarian platitudes, uh, but we basically covered everything that he brought up in there, so I'm not going to cover it again. Uh, so, this concludes the look at the enemy, anatomy of the state and why it fails, in my opinion, as a commentary on the nature of the state, politics, and the nature of government. So, uh, that basically wraps it. Um, I'm glad I could have got the got this done in two parts. Uh, I just seemed like if I was going to do more than that, it was just going to be kind of long and excessive. So, uh, thank you guys for what, uh, listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody who's uh, subscribed and, and watching on BitChute and Rumble. Or, I'm not on Rumble. Uh, <laughs> BitChute, YouTube, uh, Odyssey, uh, Podbean. Though, that's where you can find me currently. If you have any suggestions, throw them down in the comments. Like, comment, subscribe. Uh, you know, not a lot of people comment. So, uh, if you comment, I'm going to see it. And then I can write back to you. Uh, if you guys have interesting insights or, or different perspectives on this, uh, let me know. I'd be interested to hear what you say. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you guys all for listening. And have a good day.